I'm Hope Manu Lal. I'm the director of the Columbia Water Center, and I'm very pleased that you were able to come today for our meeting that was jointly organized with Science, Columbia World Projects, and a bunch of collaborators, which we are very happy to have with us. Um, we are running a little behind, so instead of giving you a long talk uh, of introduction, I will say, welcome, join us. Uh, at the Columbia Water Center, we've been focused more on, in these kind of events especially, listening to people rather than telling you about all the things we are doing. And we hope that we are participating in a process where with the work that we do, we are trying to set a vision for the future. And one of the things I say when I'm asked to give these kind of talks at other fora is that we need to actually set aspirations of people. So Seth talked about drinking water quality and my statement of that is all of us have watches that tell us our heart rate and all kinds of other things that are going on. We don't have faucets that tell us what's the water quality that we are imbibing. If we had that, we wouldn't have things like Flint, or at least people wouldn't be exposed to it so easily. So one of the aspirations that I'm putting before you is think of what we would like to see in the next 20 years and don't bitch about what things are today. And that applies to the climate issues we face, that applies to the water issues we face. And I think we are going to do that, we are going to be part of the solution, and bitching about the past is not what we are going to be doing. So with that, let me move this forward and invite Adam Shemp, who's a senior partner in the Environmental Law Institute, to introduce the panel of the federal group that is really going to tell us how the federal government is thinking about collectively solving these problems. Thank you, Professor Law. If you see your face up here, if you wouldn't mind coming down, I'd appreciate it. So while we're waiting for everyone to come up and take a seat, uh, first of all, welcome, good morning. And uh, over for this session, over the next hour or so, uh, we are going to try to set the stage a little bit for the rest of the day. Uh, we'll be identifying some of the more significant issues at the intersection of infrastructure, water infrastructure, and climate change, uh, as well some of the challenges, as well as hopefully some of the opportunities uh, or approaches for moving things forward. We are very fortunate, as you can tell from the screen, uh, to have uh, quite a wonderful collection of officials from a wide variety of federal, U.S. federal government agencies with us. Uh, all of those agencies directly relevant to the water issues that we are talking about today. Their bios are available, their full bios are available online. I would highly recommend taking a look at those, especially since some of our uh, panelists here have actually had multiple iterations in their career working for various agencies and other entities uh, that are all going to be relevant to the, uh, their approach and their view of these different issues that we're talking about. So for the sake of time, I'm going to be very brief in introducing this large panel. Um, we will start in no particular order. Uh, and if you wouldn't mind, actually, since, well, I guess your pictures are up there, so it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, Candace Valsing is the Associate Director of Climate, Energy, and Environment and Science at the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, Gloria Montano Green is the Deputy Undersecretary for USDA's Farm Production and Conservation Mission Area. Wendy Wilkes is a senior advisor to the assistant administrator for water at the EPA. Uh, Sarah Kapnick is senior uh, is chief scientist for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. David Palumbo is the deputy commissioner of operations for the Bureau of Reclamation in the Department of the Interior. Mike Connor is the assistant secretary of the Army for Civil Works. And uh, Nick Shufro is the deputy assistant administrator for the risk management directorate in the Federal Insurance and Mitigation Administration. So thank you all for being here today, making the journey. Uh, I will start this session with a few very admittedly broad questions uh, of our panelists, and then uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for some questions from all of you. So to start, uh, and Sarah, David, Mike, and Nick, I'm particularly looking at you for, for this one. Uh, as our changing climate is affecting the severity of floods and droughts and exposing the limits of especially our large water infrastructure like dams and levees, uh, as well as our forecasting capabilities, 
Uh, what do you see as needing to be done to mitigate the risks associated with these realities? And if, you, if you're able to, what are your respective agencies doing in that regard? Uh, I guess I'll just start to my left and uh, Mike. Thanks, Adam. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of my esteemed colleagues. And I appreciate the, the platform you just gave to, I, I think, uh, put in my plug for what I think is reality here, the best strategy to deal with the challenges that you just referenced is to stop the bleeding with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, right now, you referenced the extremes that we're having, the proliferation of one in 1,000 year precipitation events, which obviously the paradigm shifted. They're no longer one in 1,000 years. The extreme drought, aridity, that we're facing. All of those are being driven by a climate that's changed uh, 1.1 degrees Celsius in, po in uh, posted industrial times. And we're on a projection right now to be in the two and a half to three and a half degrees Celsius range. So strategy number one is to do what the president has been advocating, what the Congress has now acted on, which is to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and deal with uh, the um, root cause of climate change. Then we can get on to the resilience adaptation strategies. And I think, you know, from the infrastructure pers perspective, um, we have to recognize that we have water resources infrastructure that was built for a world and a climate that no longer exists. But that doesn't mean it doesn't have great value. Uh, it just means, I think, we have to re-engineer it. We have to integrate it with new systems. We have to bring in new features. Uh, all with the goal of uh, recognizing the change in climate, the extremes in weather that we're going to have, uh, and then always looking to restore hydrologic function as much as possible because, once again, that's the best reservoir we have when we recharge our aquifers, when we um, can use our natural systems uh, to the best uh, case possible. So uh, I think also we have to re operate that infrastructure um, and look at the, once again, the climate that we, we engineered that infrastructure to address, the systems that we thought, the natural snowpack and when it would come off, all that is changing. So we have to reoperate the, those systems uh, that we have in place. And I can give a number of examples um, as the conversation moves on of, of how we at the Army Corps are trying to do some of the things that I just mentioned. And then lastly, I think um, we have to recognize limits in forecasting and the need to uh, invest in better forecasting, predictive models, um, all the things that we think we understand what's going on. We try and marshal our resources to strategize to address those challenges and then Colorado River uh, system is the perfect example where uh, there's been a collection of success over the last two decades in reducing water use in the Colorado River system. There's been modeled strategies to deal with the risk of Lake Mead and Lake Powell falling uh, to critically low elevations. And whether it's 2007 uh, guidelines, whether it's the 2019 drought contingency plan, whether it's other conservation actions, that we thought would reduce that risk, uh, that risk hasn't been addressed, obviously. So better forecasting, modeling tools. We need to make the investments. Uh, I know nothing about those investments other than I was down at our Engineering Research and Development Center a couple weeks ago, and it's all about supercomputing capability as well as data uh, acquisition and then putting very smart people to work to do the things we need to do. David, I think Mike might have teed you up. You want to go next? So, so, sounds great. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. It's great to be with you all here today. Um, since it is Climate Week, and to piggyback off what Mike said with respect to what we're seeing in the West, in the Western United States, I, I know this isn't necessarily novel for all y'all, but just to recognize that increase in temperature that Mike mentioned is fundamentally the problem that we're seeing in the West. Um, while we have, in many cases, close to average precipitation, whether it be snow or rain, we are not getting runoff into reservoirs uh, 
at all close to average. Just for example, in 2021 in the Colorado River Basin, we had 90% of average snowpack. It, it uh, materialized and peaked a little bit earlier than normal, but it was around 90% of average. The actual inflow into the reservoir, that runoff, was about 30% of average. It's a phenomena what we're seeing across the West. It's a real problem. It's causing problems for our infrastructure. We need to be much smarter about, as Mike said, how we operate that infrastructure, where we site that infrastructure, how we design that infrastructure, and how we adapt that infrastructure. Um, you know, the obvious impact that we're seeing uh, that everybody could guess with reduced runoff is reduced storage. Uh, so looking at our storage uh, capabilities and again where those are sited, uh, how we operate those, how we retrofit those is going to be fundamental to adapting to a new future with what are the real plausible hydrologies that, that we uh, are foreseeing. Um, a few other things I wanted to mention with respect to where I think we need to go. It's both on the supply side and it's on the demand side. With respect to supply, we need to become real, get real about what those inflows are looking like. And we need to balance those with outflows with a reasonable expectation of year-to-year -year storage and what might be occurring with the system so we can have a sustainable storage to feed uh, our needs in the lean years and take advantage of the uh, few uh, fat years that we'll have. Um, looking at other infrastructure investments, uh, augmentation is, is key. Water recycling, desalinization, through the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Bureau of Reclamation has uh, several billion dollars available for water recycling, water reuse, desalinization, improved storage. And so looking at ways in which to augment water through these technologies will be key for the future. Um, Mike mentioned forecasting. We need to be smarter about what inflows are going to be. Uh, we need to look both at seasonal, subseasonal, and long-term forecasting and manage our demands and expectations of supply in a smart way. Um, and the, maybe the final item I'll mention is on the demand side. Uh, we need to look at conservation measures that really materialize in new wet water saved in the system. Uh, there's lots of technologies out there to improve efficiencies, improve conservation, but what we need to focus on is keeping that water in the system. Uh, maybe an unintended consequence of some conservation measures, some efficiency measures, is we have reduced uh, water use on a particular parcel of land or for a particular municipality. And what we end up doing is just increasing the irrigation on an additional parcel of land or it, uh, uh, increase usage in a growth of a municipality. So we need to focus on reducing that um, expansion that sometimes comes about after water efficiency or water conservation projects. Thank you, David. Sarah? Yes, thank you. Um, so my agency, NOAA, is in charge of providing the authoritative understanding of climate and weather. So we provide the data of historical data of climate, but then we also give the forward projections as well as all the forecasts. So delivering on those needs, uh, we are actively working on developing projections and projection information for that decision making for those long-term infrastructure problems of what's happening in the future. So the projections of climate of resolutions needed to be able to actually use it, make it usable by the users um, for understanding the future of drought, future of extreme precipitation, future of heat in these regions for the management of water on those long-term timescales. Um, that information flows through new products that it, we have recently come out um, that we've done with many of the partner agencies here. Um, CAMERA, which is resilience.climate.gov, which now allows for exploring climate information and climate projection information across the United States. It gives information on all those different climate variables, but it also gives adaptation and resiliency planning 
and examples across the United States on what people are doing with water as being one of them on conservation efforts, even also with restoration of wetlands um, and other environments to also deal with ecological issues related to water. We also provide improvements in forecast. We provide the forecasts and the seasonal predictions that are needed around precipitation, temperature, heat, um, increasingly different types of storms as well that deliver water, atmospheric rivers, uh, tropical cyclones. And so from that, we are trying to advance our ability to also forecast these extreme events because even in a climate in changing climate, our ability to forecast these events is also fundamentally changing. And so it's improving our models that do the forecasting, but it's also improving our observational data systems, the information that we're pulling into it to make those forecasts or the seasonal predictions better are also improving. So within, um, within the IRA budget, um, and also NOAA has put forward an entire aircraft plan. We are planning to buy purchase new aircraft. That ac aircraft will be used as a hurricane hunter to be able to go through storms. So we know hurricane strength, how much water will be coming down from the storm strength um, location. But those same aircrafts that we use for hurricanes, we also fly in the west coast for atmospheric rivers. And so we fly into the atmospheric river storms, which helps us improve our predictions of how much water is going to come out of those storms, um, how much is in them, the intensity, the winds, and then also forecast of where they're going. And that is critical for the operational side for the forecasts on weather timescales of up to two weeks, but even uh, seasonal prediction for a couple of months of how, of how many storms will we get, what is the strength, how much water will be coming from them. Um, because the reaction and the management of these water and systems, particularly in the West, where you only have a couple of days a year that can give you extreme precipitation, where increasingly stakeholders and water managers are asking us for this information of how much water do you expect over the entire season versus how much in the storm, is they're figuring out how to manage the little water that does fall from the sky. So in their flood management plans, they aren't um, releasing all the water in the reservoirs, which then leads to potential for undercatch of water later on in the season if there's no more storms. Um, so we break it down into it needs for improvement on the forecasting side, the seasonal prediction side, as well as all the climate projections and making sure we're putting that information out there. That's impressive. I didn't know about the planes. That's pretty cool. Nick? So good morning, and thank you for uh, having FEMA here. And uh, Nice to be here with all my colleagues from the federal government. Um, so quick personal observation before I go into the discussion about FEMA. Um, this question was on floods and droughts. And I just came back from a couple weeks in France. And it was amazing to go through the country. And the Loire River, which is known for its chateaus and uh, barges where tourists go, and, and um, there is no river. It's pretty much all dried up. And it was just really interesting to see the impacts of drought on a country and getting a different perspective. And uh, I wrote about it yes, uh, yesterday, sent it out to our organization, and showed pictures. It's, it's really interesting what's happening there. And obviously, we're seeing it across the nation here. So I'm with the Federal Insurance and Mitigation Administration, or FIMA, which is part of FEMA. And most people think about uh, FEMA and think about people wearing windbreakers, taking disaster assistance, information after storms, handing out water bottles, um, and things like that. But I belong to the Mitigation Administration. Uh, we, I'm part of the Risk Management Directorate, and we try and figure out what we can do to reduce future disaster suffering. And in this area, we have one small program, uh, which is the National Dam Safety Program, also uh, a sister program, the High Hazard Potential Dam Program. And um, these were very small programs authorized to about $12 million a year. And given the American Society of Civil Engineers rating of dams and levees, which has recently improved from a D to a C minus, and I know C minuses are not good grades, uh, we have about 91,000 dams across the nation. Um, and those dams are about a year older than I am. So the average age is 61. And um, they are, a lot of them are in failing shape. And um, these programs, uh, there is some risk because if you think about downstream communities, all we need is one large event to happen, a dam to fail, and we could have significant impacts to downstream communities. So our small program received, uh, and it was $23 million in total on an av average annual appropriation. And looking forward and trying to reduce the potential risk 
consistent with our FEMA strategy that was released in uh, December of last year around trying to create a climate resilient nation um, and helping people before, during, and after. Uh, we received about $800 million worth of uh, funding over five years to address the dam infrastructure. And so contrary to some of my colleagues that are really focused on data, although we do a lot of data, we're really trying to operationalize how do we, how do we identify which dams needs, need inspections, which dams need to be removed, what can we do? Because as we see uh, more intense precipitation events uh, with more water coming in, the risk of overtopping and failure of dams increases. And so um, happy to talk more about it, but right now I think what I wanted to just say was that we are looking at this one specific area we have a broad mandate, but this is one area that we're focused on in terms of dam safety, and there are plenty of opportunities. We'd love to get uh, the 91,000 dams that are owned by states and private entities and utilities, some of those utilities that uh, were mentioned earlier. Uh, we'd like to get them into much better shape. It would be great to get them up to a B or a B plus, um, and there are plenty of opportunities working with my colleagues from uh, the Army Corps and the Bureau of Reclamation, NOAA, others, just there's plenty of opportunity. Thank you, Nick. All right, shifting gears just a little bit. Uh, so we've already heard about, uh, and we will hear more about Jackson, Mississippi, uh, Flint, Michigan, countless other communities, as well as PFAS concerns, failing septic and sewer systems, and, and the list goes on and on in terms of other examples of our, our infrastructure uh, inadequacies. And so from that standpoint, the EPA, the USDA, both have programs directed to help communities address some of these challenges. And Gloria and Wendy, I'm particularly looking at you. Uh, could you talk a little bit about these efforts and what you see as really uh, needing to be done to truly address some of these challenges? And I guess I'll just go from my left, uh, uh, Wendy and then Gloria. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting the EPA to be here. Thank you all in the audience for your attendance, attention, your commitment to furthering um, the water work in our country. Um, as, as you illustrated in the question, we have a lot of challenges. And I kind of want to just take a moment to recognize we have seven federal panelists here from seven different pillars of our federal government, right? Um, so I think it's really illustrative of not just you know, the critical role that water plays in our daily lives, but also how complicated it is to manage and to govern, right? It really takes a little bit of, from all of us um, partnering on how we manage our water resources in this country. So um, thank you to my fellow panelists for being here as well. Um, so I, I really wanted to address three different um, topics. You just heard about one, climate change. I'm going to add a little bit of my perspective on that. Um, but I want to start with the chronic underinvestment um, in our nation's water infrastructure, which, you know, in some cases, it's infrastructure investment that never arrived, right? We have pockets of our country that are still experiencing, you know, uh, no running water in their homes, you know, no, we have straight pipes um, that are putting raw sewage out on the ground. So, um, in some places, really dire conditions. Um, the second, climate change. And then the third, I'm going to talk about how we're following the science on some of the water contaminants that I think are top of mind for a lot of our water utilities. So um, first, the long-term underinvestment in our water infrastructure. Um, you know, this has been a challenge for decades. It's been widely recognized. We're now, you know, seeing it acutely impact um, people's daily lives in places like Jackson. But also places that are not large enough to make headlines, right? We've got a lot of uh, 51,000 plus community water systems as Seth set us up um, earlier with. That's a lot to govern, that's a lot to um, regulate, and there are communities that fall between the cracks. And um, so the nation's water infrastructure, it's aging, it's outdated, it's leaving our public health, our economy, our communities at risk, right? Um, the Biden administration recognized this and worked with Congress last fall to pass the bipartisan infrastructure law, $50 billion, the largest federal investment in water infrastructure. Um, I have the honor in my position at EPA to help steward this funding. Um, so that's where most of my expertise lies. 
Um, as we deploy these resources, you know, it's really important that we are not just building for today's needs, right? But we're recognizing what we're going to need in 100 years because water infrastructure has an incredibly long life cycle, right? So the decisions we're making today, how we spend this five years of $50 billion is going to impact our nation and our communities for decades and potentially, you know, the next century. So we want to get it right. And for too long, underserved communities have been deprived of the opportunities that safe drinking water and wastewater services provide. Um, we are really focused on ensuring that underserved and disadvantaged communities have the opportunity to use this investment and to use it well. And um, what's great is through the bipartisan infrastructure law, nearly half of the funding um, has to go out as grants and forgivable loans to underserved and disadvantaged communities. So we're really excited. It's a mandate to do better than what's been done before. So climate change, we, we just heard quite a bit about that. I just want to reemphasize how often climate change is felt as water stress. It's a lot of times the first way a community notices the impacts of climate change, whether it's water, you know, too much water, too little water, or changing water quality. Um, we have, with the bipartisan infrastructure law, maybe the largest opportunity we'll have in my lifetime to impact the water infrastructure and how we are responding to climate change, how we are mitigating, right? It's no longer at EPA a conversation when we talk about climate change of when, it is how we are mitigating, how we are adapting, and how we are responding. Um, and then the last thing I wanna touch on is um, following the science on contaminants. So going back to kind of the core challenges that our water systems face, um, contaminants like lead and PFAS need to be addressed. So the, the science on lead is clear. We've known for a long time, right? There's, there's no safe level of lead. We now, through the bipartisan infrastructure law, have dedicated funding, $15 billion, to begin replacing our lead pipes across the country. Is $15 billion enough? Probably not. Are we gonna make it stretch as far as we can? Absolutely. So we're gonna do what we can with the investment that we have, um, and we're gonna start removing these pipes. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure law also provides $5 billion to the state revolving funds and another $5 billion through grants to small and disadvantaged communities um, for emerging contaminants and specifically PFAS remediation. So this is big. A lot of communities have been on the front lines, particularly water systems, in dealing with PFAS. Did they create the problem? Probably not. In most cases, no. They are receivers of the water, right, that has been contaminated. And this Funding is an opportunity to really help those systems that have been on the front lines of dealing with this contamination. Um, so combining the funding, we are trying to align our regulatory program. We are working on um, you know, national primary drinking water regulation for PFOA and PFOS. We're working on updating the lead and copper rule. Right. So we know that money alone cannot solve these problems. Um, so we're trying to align our regulatory agenda as well. And right, it's not money alone. So we have to be create, thinking creatively about how we deploy the bill funds equitably. We have to be applying the lens of resilience to all things we do, in particular, our infrastructure investments. And then the, the third kind of thing I want to conclude, list, conclude with is you know, prioritizing partnerships because you know, with PFAS, with lead, with climate change, not one of us can solve it alone. It's, it's going to have to be in partnership. So I think I will end there and turn it over to Gloria. Um, good morning, buenos dias. Uh, Gloria Montaña Green, I'm the Deputy Undersecretary of Farm Production and Conservation at USDA. Um, so I actually spend most of my space in the farmer, rancher, private forest landowner uh, work providing safety net services, uh, conservation, disaster relief, uh, risk management tools. Um, but the Department of Agriculture, for those of you who aren't familiar, if, um, I think we do everything. Um, so if we're not interacting, collaborating with everyone across, the, <laughs> I was like looking at, yeah, all of you across the hall, across the ways to be able to match. Um, our expertise tends to be a lot in the rural communities. And so when we're talking about the water infrastructure and the water quantity, water quality, um, in addition to having agriculture communities there, those are the ones that are most vulnerable and probably the most at need. 
Um, so I will just be able to share that some of the requests that you had was on the infrastructure is not actually within my mission area, but in the Department of Agriculture Rural De uh, Development Division, some specific support that we are able to provide on either um, utility services and wastewater treatment, um, we are probably funding the majority of those rural communities that need to have those infrastructures. And I'll just say that I'm from a small town in Arlington, Arizona. I'm an Arizonan. Um, and growing up before understanding Department of Agriculture and Federal Government, um, you know, my family's water supply just didn't exist um, in a very rural community. And so the fear was, do not go and test the water. And we as a small community decided not to test the water and we just all made sure to boil and bring in water. That's a personal experience. And then, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later, uh, working in the Department of Agriculture, you actually understand where that impact is to be able to have a different quality of life. So when you're thinking about some of these larger communities in these uh, impacted areas, I think uh, we don't actually break service, um, but we actually think about how we leverage our respective authorities. So in those rural communities needing to have some of those wastewater um, and utility investments, um, how we collaborate across, uh, be it and energy is not here, but, uh, or with EPA, et cetera. There are a lot of great opportunities amongst us um, with implementing um, the decision making for where we're focusing our funds. Um, the Justice 40 work, which is a huge priority for this administration, is also a North Star for us on where we're investing. Those are communities that tend to be limited resources, to, communities that have tend to not um, uh, been invited potentially to have some of the infrastructure in the past and are the ones that we're hearing in the headlines at the moment of needing the most. Um, we're seeing it right now um, just in every disaster that's across the country. And so I think whenever we've been making our decisions, that's uh, where we've been putting forward. Within my mission area, within bipartisan infrastructure law, Natural Resources Conservation Services received about a billion dollars to be able to invest in some of those watersheds. We also have dams that we don't necessarily own, but we helped create about six years ago, and they are time. It is time for them to have infrastructure. And what that means for some of that watershed development, some of that restoration of water, some of that quality of water, um, has made really um, impactful conversations. And I'll just share that. You know, um, sometimes it's not just the dollars, it's the investment to be able to bring the partners together to be able to have that um, collaboration and those dollar amounts. I got to announce $75,000 um, in a tribal community that is still trying to recover from two forest fires that occurred 20 years ago. And the $75,000, what it has for opportunity for impact to be able to think about the watershed investment for future dollars and future federal um, and future private and future um, state investment uh, means a restoration of economy um, and agriculture, restoration of water quality, um, collaboration with EPA, uh, collaboration with Army Corps to be able to bring funds, and then also returning um, a generational loss of agriculture um, and history. Uh, so those impacts of what we're thinking about water and what it means to individuals and quality of life. Um, and then because if I could take the moment of it, right, um, and it is climate week and it is water, um, agriculture tends to be a lot of the conversations within agriculture use. And to be able to think about who is really seeing the change of, of climate change, it is your farmers and your ranchers, your private sports landowners who are in touch with the dirt more so than the rest of us are. Um, they also need to have the right tools to be able to support those transitions because they're in the riskiest business in the country in the world. One crop season, one disaster, throws them out or takes them out of business. And so how are we thinking about incentivizing and how are we thinking about helping them move to those uh, flood irrigation, to drip irrigation, or to pivot, uh, or to be able to think about um, soil health to be able to better absorb some of those waters and to be able to maintain the production they need to. In addition to how we're thinking about supporting them from moment to moment is how are we thinking about the long term. So last week, um, the Secretary of Agriculture announced $2.8 billion in climate smart commodities programs, which is a significant investment. Um, and that was just for the large first pool of funding that we did to be able to think about how do we develop the market to be able to strengthen agriculture, but to also meet the rise of the occasion to address climate change. And so with that, and I have to remember these numbers, um, right, and we're expecting to impact over 25 million acres of land, uh, over 50,000 farmers, and we'll do 15 million metric tons of carbon dioxide that we'll be removing. And that's without the Inflation Reduction Act. The Inflation Reduction Act also provides major opportunities. So when we're thinking about um, water quality, water quantity, those are things that are gonna be fundamental throughout those projects as well. And we're thinking about irrigation efficiencies um, that are gonna be invested in some of those 
uh, partners. So I think there's a lot of great opportunities and how we consider those investments and how we also meet, for me, those communities that we most work with, which is if you incentivize and you show, right, if a farmer across the way has implemented those practices and is showing those rewards, um, they will be able to start doing that and that adoption, that scalability, which is the whole purpose of the Climate Smart Commodities work. Um, how do we learn and how we have that scalability to be able to meet, um, which we can't separate, the climate change, the greenhouse gas emissions, and water quantity use. Thank you. I don't think I've ever heard more key points covered in five minutes in my life. That was very well done. All right, last but not least, certainly, Candace, you get your own question. Um, so from what's been mentioned thus far today and your familiarity with these issues, what do you see as being some of the biggest challenges to making the case to Congress financially, scientifically, about these problems and potential solutions? And what information or other help do you think would be needed? I think kind of teeing up later today with academia and, and um, uh, industry and so forth. Thank you, um, and thank you guys for all inviting us here. As, as we've all noted, there's a lot of us, and that's because this is really important, so thank you. Uh, just to start, I think what you've probably seen, hopefully, is that uh, the Biden administration has made water a huge priority. Um, the investments that we've made, uh, the president fought for and secured, and they are really historic investments. Um, I, you've heard a lot of acronyms and a lot of numbers thrown out today, so just to try to put a bow around that, um, the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed last year included $50 billion for direct investments for water. The Inflation Reduction Act, which was just passed months ago, uh, was additional investments for drought, for flooding. Uh, and then, of course, the American Rescue Plan, which provided $350 billion of money that could be accessed for water infrastructure. That is a lot, so I will say it again, $350 billion. Um, this president has really made a difference in the fundamental way that we invest in water in this country. Um, and so uh, just want to say it's not just about, which I think you've seen now, it's not just about getting dollars out the door and securing investment. We've also, I worked with my colleagues across the board here, um, and they've worked with each other in, in, in partnerships to put together strategies to strategically think, how can we get money for lead pipes out? How can we use every lever? to um, just make sure that we're really making investments in PFAS and the communities that need the most. Um, we put out an international strategy on climate. Um, we have uh, the USDA and EPA have worked together on water and waste infrastructure throughout the South and are actively visiting communities to make a real meaningful difference. Um, and so it's not, like I said, it's not just getting dollars out the door. It's really thinking strategically how to use them. Um, but you asked us what we need, so I'll try to actually answer your question. Um, of course, you know, we do have these large increases in funding, um, which have been fundamental and will be fundamental, but we also, of course, um, are not going to continue uh, needing more strategic resources. For example, earlier this month, we sent a request to Congress for additional disaster funding, which will help with floods and droughts. Um, but, and we also... Um, we also need, you know, the, the funding investments that I've mentioned today have been large injections of funding. Um, we also need to work through our annual preparations process, through our budget, to ensure we have long-term investments to fundamentally shift the way we think about water. Um, one of the things we've done in our past two budgets is the president has asked for mandatory funding for tribal water settlements, and that's um, immensely important. I was visited by a community uh, two weeks ago where they showed me pictures of a, a water pipe that was about two inches thick that had duct tape on it, um, and that's how they're getting their water. So we really do need these continued investments, um, and we'll continue to work with Congress on those. But, um, you know, to boil down, I think, what we three, we've all said here, and, and there haven't been enough water puns, so I'm just going to start with boil down, and we can go from there, um, into, into, into three things uh, in, that I, I think would be helpful for this group to focus on, um, is one, data and innovation, to leveraging dollars, and three, equitable distribution. And I think you've heard about that across my colleagues here. Um, so first, in terms of data innovation, you know, NOAA released this camera tool uh, a few weeks ago, um, which will help the, not only the federal government, but cities and states better and make better investments and better strategic choices in how to minimize their risk 
um, for climate, for drought, for flooding. And so that's incredibly important. And as we think and um, you know, I'll work together over the course of the day and figuring out how, what is that data that's most helpful uh, from the federal government? What are we providing? What are we not providing? It'd be great to know. Um, how can we help with um, ensuring that our, the dollars that we do have are going to the most innovative technologies? That'd be helpful for us to know. Second, leveraging dollars. I think you heard partnerships are incredibly important. Um, we have a lot of funding, but how can we all work together? The $350 billion that are available to states and cities, um, already we're seeing you know, states and cities invest in billions of dollars, but how can we get more? How can we um, prioritize that? How can we all uh, work together to collaboratively raise the, the priority that water is within this funding? Um, earlier, uh, I think it was last week, EPA released um, uh, $1.1 billion that 18 states um, put together plans to be able to access this bipartisan infrastructure law funding. Um, but there are, there, are, there are more than 18 states, so how can we all work together to, um, to ensure that, that states are accessing this funding that we have? Um, and so that's working better to leverage, um, leverage funding, create new partnerships. And third is equitable distribution. You heard Justice 40 mentioned today. So Justice 40, for those who aren't familiar with it, is uh, the president's initiative to target 40% of our climate and clean energy investments into disadvantaged communities. And this is a historic initiative. This is a, a massive undertaking to fundamentally change how we target um, benefits to disadvantaged communities is something that we're all collabor collaboratively working together across the government. And if we're, not, if we're not giving the funding that we have to the communities that need us most, we're really not doing our jobs here. Um, and so that's the other thing that we could, we could use your help with. And we collectively are doing everything we can. We know it's a, a slow process to be able to fundamentally shift how we target benefits, especially for water to communities, especially when a lot of the funding is, is going to states um, through formula funds. But we've been using all the tools we can. Um, Administrator Regan, uh, earlier this summer, released a letter to governors encouraging them to target these resources to the communities that need them most. And we're also working through technical assistance to ensure that we're, we're doing our part. So um, if I can come back to, to where we started, um, I think the title of this conference is Rethinking Water. Um, I would say that the president has given us the tools to fundamentally change how we rethink water. And now it's time for us to not only rethink, but to act. Um, and if we work together, if we focus on these, these three Ds that I, that I noted, um, as well as so many more, but as, as the first speaker said today, there's so many directions you go, can go with water. I think it's helpful to focus on um, these three. Not only can we rethink water, but we can fundamentally improve people's lives, and that's what we're all trying to do here. It's a good charge coming from the panel. Uh, any quick reactions before we go to? Yeah. Can I just build on something that I think a number of the panelists said, but gets to what Candace just talked about with respect to leveraging and building equity and investing and in using tools. So one example, and Nicholas referenced the 91,000 dams, uh, non-federal dams out there in various states of condition or, or lack of condition. Um, we have had this tool in the Army Civil Works portfolio that's been unused for about six, seven years since Congress first authorized. It's, it was the WIFIA Act. It's uh, Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act. Uh, EPA has stood up a program, low interest loans, greatly leveraged non-federal resources to do a lot of great work in wastewater infrastructure development, water supply development activities. We at the Army Corps had this program to rehabilitate non-federal dams. Uh, languished, not funded, not stood up. Uh, this administration came in, I think, recognizing because of disasters uh, the need to rehabilitate non-federal dams, and we've got a proposed rulemaking now in place to use funds provided in the bipartisan infrastructure law where we can now, once we get this rulemaking done, finance billions of dollars. Already we have the resources now to finance billions of dollars of rehabilitation of these non-federal dams, and we will use this tool, to getting back to my first point, to how do we uh, rehabilitate dams that we can integrate with other infrastructure that might help build climate resilience. Two, obviously there's the safety factor. How do we protect communities and particularly how do we protect disadvantaged communities at risk uh, from these <clears throat> unsafe uh, facilities because they typically haven't had the money to invest in those facilities. Uh, and, and then uh, lastly, uh, environmental function, 
uh, that authority will also let us look at dams that need to be removed uh, for safety reasons as well as environmental function reasons. So this is a program that languished. Uh, given the need and given the focus of this administration, and Candace was directly in, involved in this. So I, th I, th I think if, if Candace spends as much time on other programs in her portfolio as she does on Army Civil Works, she doesn't sleep. Uh, that's my takeaway. But we're uh, up and running and we'll get this going. And it's just another example of the focus on water, using tools, haven't been used, and leveraging those resources to benefit hopefully all communities, particularly disadvantaged communities. Nick, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, so I'm not smart enough to come up with a fourth D on the, on the fly, but um, some of the work that we're doing, we heard about Justice 40, and as an example, and when you're looking at standing up a program that was a tiny program and now is a real robust program, how do you sit there and figure out how to give advantages and benefits to disadvantaged communities around dams? Because you can look at the downstream communities, but we really need, as part of our process, we're trying to come up with a strategy around equity, which is one of our three principles on the, on the strategy, uh, the FEMA strategy. And so um, uh, our, our mandate is federally supported, state managed, and locally implemented. That's what we talk about all the time. And um, to that, I would just throw out to everybody in the audience, as you're thinking about life after whatever you're doing right now, there are plenty of opportunities, whether it's at the federal level, uh, state level, local level, we're all looking for resources and bright people to help us figure out where we go. And so consider it because I think everybody on this panel is hiring um, and we're, you know, we're looking for really good talent, and really smart people. So there are opportunities out there. Before we go to Q and A, is there anything else anybody else has? Yeah. Um, I had also say that the theme of this has all been the collaboration that you're seeing across the federal government. But I, we didn't necessarily add also the partnerships that are starting to happen with industry and with private industry. Um, these problems, figuring out how to make these decisions and getting the information out there isn't just enough. It's actually then, how does it get taken up? How does it get used? How does it get applied? And so increasingly for this very systems-based problem that we are dealing with regarding to water and climate change mixed in, we're finding that we have to build those partnerships to make sure that for us now of delivering the data and services that people need, but then also engaging on how does that get taken up and how does it get used into those decision processes and specifically discussed here, Justice 40 as well, when you have so many considerations and issues in certain communities as well, climate change can often be something that's thought of as something far away, so it's a problem that is dealt with later. And so in the integrated plans and programs that we have with that, there is overall trying to bring together all the problems and issues with climate change as one, so you start trying to build solutions that address all of them. And being able to do that requires cross-agency uh, collaboration, but also collaboration with local communities in the private sector to be able to actually address those systematic problems that we see. I completely agree. You know, maybe right. I'll mention one other thing. One, one more and then we'll get, yeah, go ahead. W with respect to the, the, the funding and some guiding principles that, that we're following in the Bureau of Reclamation, there, there's five. One of which is timeliness. We heard about that here today where we need to get the money on the ground as quickly as possible. We want to do it as effectively as possible and as equity, equitably as possible. And also look at the existing authorities we have, which of course aren't mutually exclusive to getting it on the ground as quickly as possible. But a, a fundamental objective, whether it be we, we received $4.6 billion in the Infrastructure Reinvest or in Inflation Reinvestment Act, and then the bipartisan infrastructure law, we have $10.8 billion. $2.5 billion is for Indian water rights settlements, as Candace mentioned. But to, to deploy that money in a way that creates durable solutions, not just Band-Aids or, or short-term fixes. We need short-term fixes to bridge to these long-term durable solutions where infrastructure is deployed in a smart way, where infrastructures may be reoperated in a smart way or removed in a smart way, but to do that and create a durable foundation for that bridge to land on. And the importance of community and engagement in order to be able to do that effectively over the long term, absolutely, which as many of you have mentioned, I think is critical. It's hard but it's really important to do this right. Okay, uh, last few minutes that we have, any questions from the audience? Oh, go ahead. So 
So we're, we're getting some great questions here. So uh, the first question is, um, you've talked about the, the accessibility of capital, um, but the need for partnerships and strategies. Can you define some what you mean by that and something pr potentially actionable for the audience here in terms of strategies and partnerships that you've seen you would like to see? I'll start and then Mr. Figgelin. So I think a good example of a, a partnership which we launched in the, uh, the lead pipes and paint strategy last year um, is uh, it's essentially the, the EPA is working with the Department of Labor, unions, and states to be able to accelerate the amount of lead pipes replacements that we're doing in a community to ensure that they're being replaced with, with uh, strong labor practices, to ensure that states are engaged, to ensure that we're working with the utilities all at the same time so we can create models and best practices of how to deploy dollars as fast as possible in a way that's as collaborative as possible. We bring all the actors in. Um, we'll probably, you know, at some point soon announce where those accelerators are going to be, but the goal is to pull everyone together, uh, all the relevant parties, to create models of best practices. So not only can we accelerate lead pipe replacement in uh, a few of the communities that we're going to focus on, but scale it up nationally and develop best practices. So, you know, states, NGOs, water utilities, federal government, all collaborating together uh, to develop best practices. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to jump in here. So um, some, some of the things that I think I would love for this audience to, to noodle on and take into the afternoon, um, when it comes to the technical assistance, EPA for the first time is putting in quite a bit of funding for direct technical assistance to communities. We're doing it around three different pillars, w closing the wastewater access gap, general water infrastructure and getting communities ready to receive the bill funding, and then lead service line replacement. So those are our three focuses. We alone cannot reach every community that needs the help. We are partnering with states and trying to fill in the gaps from the state level technical assistance. But there is incredible opportunity in the realm of technical assistance to help communities prepare for climate ready infrastructure, integrating cybersecurity, accessing the bill funding. It's gonna be a lot of communities that have never accessed federal resources before. It's pretty time intensive. It's not, you know, the, the state revolving funds aren't um, maybe the worst in terms of all the paperwork, but it's, a bit, it's quite a bit and it's a lot for a community that's never done it before. So in that realm, there is so much room for partnership. There's so much room for kind of third parties, not just federal and state government helping to deploy these resources. So, so that's certainly um, one thing. The second is the partnerships between utilities. Ton of opportunity here. Seth touched on it earlier about, you know, this idea of reducing the number of water systems. As the stresses increase, whether they're O&M costs, whether it's climate stress, whether it's workforce stresses, partnerships across communities are going to be necessary to maintain and improve our water infrastructure. So those are kind of the two areas that I'm really thinking about when I think about partnerships and strategies, um, and especially partnerships beyond government. Um, another way that we're doing it is through um, like through our Sea Grant program, which actually, Sea Grant, coastal communities, why does that matter for water? A lot of water treatment centers are actually also in underlying areas that can have flooding. And once you have flooding, catastrophic flooding, you also lose your water. And so through money through Sea Grant, coastal communities can then create their coastal resiliency plans. So you get the information on storm surge, on tidal flooding, on all those issues. But then you, there's partnership. The money goes in to fund that resiliency plan, which then leverages local, state, city dollars to be able to figure out what those plans should be scientifically, engineering-wise, moving those plants, utilities, all the plans because then they can access the private markets through muni bonds to be able to try and do um, sources and uses for sustainable um, programs for climate resiliency. And so these plans, once they get structured, can then actually also access private dollars and it also changes the access to different types of capital that those groups are also able to access from the private funding. Um, and I should note that before coming in as NOAA's chief scientist, I was a climate scientist um, in chart in investing at one of the big banks. And so 
this is increasingly a model that we'll be seeing of trying to access different types of capital for being able to do these plants as well. So just a quick note, um, we're also building on some of the successes that have taken place before. So EPA has state revolving funds for clean water and safe drinking water. And uh, we just set up something called the Storm Act, which is Safeguarding Tomorrow, a revolving loan fund. We've got $500 million or 100 million per year for five years. And it's to work with state and local governments to set up, um, to reduce risks from natural hazards. And it's, it's a mitigation fund. And so there are a lot of new opportunities to figure out how to actually work with localities. One, one last point I would just say, I think we're, we at the federal government level need uh, assistance in what I think would be helpful probably to academia or private industry is the area of R&D, research and development. It, the, the innovation agenda is just absolutely critical, whether it's on the front end of building better predictive tools, modeling so we can better assess risk, or on the end where we're trying to manage to that risk and, and innovate technologies, integrate natural nature-based features. Uh, my sense is we need to provide a better source of R&D funds. We need to match that with the, what private industry can bring, what academia can bring. And that's where I think, you know, from a, a financing and a, a merging of funds, that's where we really need a lot of folks. We need to understand what the opportunities out there are that people see so that we can put together the funding strategies to help, you know, prime the pump with respect to those developments. Thank you. I, I didn't cue you that, but that's the rest of our agenda for the day. So thank you. Um, I, I, one last question um, that's interesting here is it's, it's amazing that there's so many people on this panel from the federal government. How do we make sure and sustain this level of interest from the federal government today, tomorrow, five years, change of administration, change of two administrations? What would a few of you say is important to make sure that um, this importance continues over the, uh, the medium term? Well, I want to talk politics, but I don't want to talk politics. Um, I, think, I yep. think my initial reaction to that is keep doing what you're doing because the focus on water, the progress we're making with respect to highlighting the need to invest in the water sector, all of that is on a very good trajectory, and it's, be, it's on a good trajectory because it's kind of stayed out of politics. Um, it's, there's some kind of bipartisan sense that, you know, this is important to the country. It's just absolutely critical, uh, and it affects every community and every aspect of every community. Uh, and from that standpoint, the case has been made well, uh, and I think, you know, demonstrating continued progress by uh, projects that build in resilience, solutions that address community needs, Success begets success, I think, in telling those stories and highlighting what we can do through the partnerships across the federal government, vertically through state, local, and tribal governments, uh, and continuing to demonstrate that we're moving forward and addressing problems, even though the challenges are just so immense, I think is really important to sustain that broad support that exists. And just to, to build on that, I mean, I can commit to you that the, the priority will not change in this administration. The president is very focused on water. Um, he often reads, whether it's Jackson or Lowes County, Alabama, he'll read, these, he'll read articles, will ask us to solve a problem. You know, it's not gonna change. The vice president also very focused on lead pipes and paints. And um, you know, I commit to you that, that, that we will not see a diminished interest in water in this administration. Uh, but I also had the pleasure of serving for the Obama administration and then going to the Senate and then coming back. And so I've gotten to see firsthand about things that, uh, how we create more resilient public policy. Um, and uh, one of the ways we do that is exactly what we're doing today. You know, having everyone come together, the more resilient the partnerships and the infrastructure that we create with the federal government, with states, with cities, with communities, with nonprofits, so that we're actively holding each other accountable, the more resilient our, the, the priority today is water will be and the, the longer lasting will be. So I think today is, is an, the exact reason and the exact example and proof point on how this will continue to be a priority, um, and so super effective. That's great. If, yeah. if I could add to that, right, I think the other part is when you're talking about some of these communities, and we haven't explicitly uh, dove deeper into them, but the ones that need to be touched the most are those underserved communities, which also have the greatest distrust and the greatest capacity um, and the greatest infrastructure 
to be doing the grant writing, to be doing the planning, to be doing the collaborative effort. And I think I've seen across um, everyone here and others, right, how they've uh, reached and moved forward a little bit differently in their technical assistance on how you develop. So I think some of the conversations of expectations also of how government and federal government and state partners work and local partners and nonprofits um, and industries also changes the expectation where policy is and where the demand will happen. And so some of those communities have just been so uh, far removed that they are decades behind um, because the investments didn't exist under the Obama administration, but the desire did. And now when you have the desire and the investments that are able to get through. So I just think... Um, when you're looking at partnership work that you guys are doing collectively is to be able to think about the research work, um, the technical bill, some of that trust building, some of that grant writing support, um, and some of that investment program management support tools. I think that's going to be helping for the longer. We've already started seeing for individuals that we were able to start investing in some of the research aspects of it for them to be able to have the next set of plans that they have for three and ten year plans, which wasn't something they had six months ago. So I just think yeah, it starts... Uh, momentum is moving and it just keeps moving. Thank you. Um, so with that, uh, I don't think we could have queued up the agenda better, but thank you, Adam. Thank you to the panel. Um, big round of applause for everybody. <laughs>